Amen. Please be seated, if you would. Actually, don't be seated, if you would. <laughs> I'd like to give a shout out to Genesis today. Uh, so, we're also in the Genesis Auditorium today. This is my Bible. God's holy word, the lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is authoritative. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a fire shut up in my bones. I must speak it. It is food for my soul. I am ready to receive it. Turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. Luke, chapter 16. Today we continue our series, Who's Your One? So we're talking about reaching out and making a difference for Christ in at least one person's life more than usual this year. And today we come to the story of two men and two destinies. Two men and two destinies. Luke, chapter 19, uh, chapter 16 verse 19, chapter 16, verse 19. There's a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores and laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades or hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus at his side. Verse 24. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may tip the finger of his wa- uh, of tip, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Please be seated. Now, sometimes Kathy and I like to uh, go to cemeteries and walk around and look at the headstones. We were in Key West a few years ago, and we saw one that so a couple that we thought were pretty good. I got a picture of one of them. It says, I told you I was sick. <laughs> Another one said, at least I know where he's sleeping tonight, his wife. <laughs> I saw one somewhere that said, I told you my feet were killing me. <laughs> Another said, I knew this would happen. If you go to really old cemeteries, uh, they used to put really a little more on the the headstone. One said, here lies Paul. Paul liked women. Ma caught Paul with two of swimming. Here lies Paul. (laughs) At peaceful rest lies Brother Claude, planted here beneath this sod. Here lies Scott, left here to rot. Here lies good old Fred. A great big rock fell on his head. I'm thinking about putting this on mine. Dear departed brother Dave chased a bear into a cave. Now, I think it's funny. There's one for this family called Spanx. And the the father's, it's a double stone, Walter. And the mother is Catherine. So if you look at it from a distance, it says, Walter Spanx Catherine. One of my favorites is says, here lies an atheist all dressed up with no place to go. <laughs> and someone wrote on, the, on, the, on it, it says, I bet he wishes that were so. Well, uh, later on in our next service, we're going to be talking about graduates. But for all of us, we need to understand you're not ready to live until you understand what happens when you die. Because if you understand what happens when you die, it will impact how you live, or it should. This passage, Jesus, the context, is talking about uh, 
the correcting the wrongness of the prosperity gospel that says you're, if you're rich, God is blessing you, and if you're bad, God will curse you. And so rich people go to heaven and poor people go to hell. So Jesus tells about this story. And this story has three lessons for us today that we all need to know and understand. First, first lesson is about death. The second lesson is about eternity. And the third lesson is about evangelism. Death, eternity, and evangelism. So let's look at the first lesson. First lesson all of us need to realize is death is a certainty. The beggar died. The rich man died. Doesn't matter who you are. Apart from Jesus coming again soon, you're going to die. It's a certainty. Uh, ben Franklin said there are only two things that are certain, death and taxes, right? And you can't get out of death. Well, three thoughts about this. A, death is an appointment that we must keep. It's an appointment that we must keep. Hebrews chapter 9 says it's appointed for men to die once. And after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. The mortality rate in the United States right now is 100%. Think about that. You can cancel your appointment with the dentist, but you can't cheat death. This also speaks against the reincarnation. It's appointed unto man to die once, and then the judgment. So smile at the person next to you and go, you're going to die. <laughs> Number two, death is the result of sin. Why, why is there death? Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it's because of sin. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why do people die? Because Adam chose to break God's law and brought the curse of death into our planet. Now, before you give him a hard time, realize that we have all broken God's law. And before you get upset at God, realize that God gave his son Amen. to be a remedy to death and to provide for us eternal life. Through Jesus Christ. Death is a result of sin. Number uh, C on your notes. Death is a result, is a matter of separation. It's a matter of separation. The rich man by, La by Abraham in the presence of God. I'm sorry. Lazarus is by Abraham in the presence of God. The rich man is in Hades. And it says that there is between us a great gulf fixed, an impossible, impassable chasm. The New Testament started to make a lot more sense to me when I understood this. When the Bible talks about death, think about separation. Physical death is separation of your soul from your body. Spiritual death is the separation of your soul from God. Eternal death is the separation of your soul from God forever. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says, They will pay the penalty and endure the punishment of everlasting destruction, banished from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Death is a matter of separation. It's the result of sin, and it is an appointment we must keep. Death is a certainty. We don't want to think about it, but we need to. Number two, earthly decisions determine eternal destinies. The earthly decisions you make will determine eternal destinies, and we're not going to talk about it today, but it will also determine your eternal rewards. There's degrees of suffering in hell, and there's degrees of blessing in heaven. Eternal, earthly decisions determine eternal destinies. Two destinies we want to talk about. First, 
A, heaven, heaven. Let's talk about heaven. It says, Lazarus, when he died, he was carried by angels to Abraham's side, and Abraham's there in the presence of the Lord. He was carried by Abra angels to the presence of the Lord. What's going to make heaven heaven? The presence of God. The unlimited, uh, overwhelming presence of God. God is light. So in heaven, you have glorious light. God is love. So in heaven, there's nothing but love. God is good. So in heaven, you have goodness and abundant joy. God is life. So heaven is filled with life. And it's life at its best. And the fullness of life. The presence of God is there. There's no curse in heaven. Jesus died to take away the curse. God created earth as paradise. It was a wonderful place. But because of the curse... Everything on planet Earth and everyone on planet Earth has been stained and tainted and diminished. Prior to sin, paradise, it was a place of peace and innocence and community. But when sin entered the world, our universe came under the consequences of sin and the curse that goes with it. Everything became stained and twisted and cheapened. Everything was polluted. Think about just the environment. Prior to sin, in paradise, no natural disasters, no floods, no storms, no gales, no tempests, tornadoes, cyclones, typhoons, whirlwinds, twisters, squalls, hurricanes, blizzards, whiteouts, blackouts, monsoons. The Weather Channel just wouldn't have anything to do in heaven. In heaven, the land, the water, and the air, perfectly pure, no pollution, no smog, no contamination, no toxic waste, no trash. There's going to be no frostbite in heaven, no sunburn in heaven, no allergies in heaven. Amen. The plant and animal and human kingdoms live together in harmony Snakes weren't poisonous, and they will not tempt us in heaven. There won't be mosquitoes, and if there are, they won't bite people. <laughs> Raccoons won't tip over your garbage cans. Termites won't eat your ports. Bees won't sting. Dogs won't bite. And uh, one man said, I'm guessing that even cats will be nice. <laughs> and then he said... Then he said, that is if a cat make it to heaven. <laughs> then he said, just kidding. Ha ha. I don't know about cats. I think in heaven there's going to be a place with just nothing but puppies. I just love puppies. Nothing but puppies. And you just go over there and just play with puppies all day. Uh, there's no germs, no viruses in heaven, no disease, no sickness, no affliction, no infirmity, no infection, no arthritis. In heaven, you're going to have no curse. Think about your body. I've accumulated negatives, my body, the last several years. I, I can hardly see. I got to wear these, and I still can't see. A lot of my teeth have, have fillings. I, had, I wore braces when I was a kid, and my teeth are still crooked. My skin burns if I look at a picture of the sun. I got a scar right here because of chicken pox. I got a scar over here because of my first cigarette when I was five. I got a scar here from uh, busting my chin open when I was six. I got cauliflower ear from wrestling. I've got dislocated thumbs. I've got separated shoulders from sports. I've got torn cartilage in my knee. I've got uh, scars. I've got an appendix scar, I've got a, a replaced hip scar, I've got a big old scar where they had to take my spleen out. I don't have any tonsils. My hair used to be reddish brown, thick and wavy. 
What are you laughing at? I always wanted to play in the NBA. What are you laughing at? I'm going to be about 6'10", about 255, thick, wavy, curly hair, dreadlocks. I'm going to play basketball. When I get tired of that, I'm going to play baseball. I'm going to play football. I'm going to sing awesome in heaven. Jerry's going to sing awesome in heaven. It's going to be amazing. Mike DeToma will sing awesome in heaven. Think about heaven. No wounded emotions in heaven. It's all going to be healed. No depression, no anxiety, no obsessive thoughts, no Manias, phobias, addictions, you're going to have a glorified soul, a glorified mind, a glorified body. Yay, heaven! Yay. But there's a second destiny. Hell. People don't want to think about it, they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to believe in it, but that doesn't change the reality of it. I would be doing you a great disservice to stand up here and say, this is my Bible, and then not tell you what the Bible says about this important subject, hell. Interesting. The Lazarus died, and he was carried by angels. The rich man died, and he was buried and went to Hades, which means the place of death, the underworld, and we call it hell. Basically a holding tank waiting the great white throne judgment, hell and the lake of fire. You know, Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven. And he actually talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. And he was pretty graphic when he talked about it. He talked about hell being a place of utter darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Everlasting punishment. Just like heaven is awesome because it's the place of God's presence, what makes hell hell is it's the place of God's absence. God is light. Hell is nothing but darkness. God is love. Hell is nothing but hatred and isolation and bitterness and loneliness. God is joy, and hell is filled with sorrow and sadness. God gives life, but hell is nothing but destruction and deterioration. God gives peace, but hell is a place of fear, nightmares coming real. The last few months I've been, in my own study, I've just been thinking a lot about eternity. The society we live in now doesn't want to think about eternity. Or they just say it all ends or it's all going to be good or you get reincarnated. That's not the truth. The truth is there's a real heaven. And there's a real hell. And the truth is more people are going to go to hell than we think. Everybody doesn't go to heaven. Two destinies, B, two decisions. Two decisions. Dependency upon God or dependency upon something other than God. Dependency upon God or dependency on something other than God. The name Lazarus means God is my help. Jesus told this story specifically with this name, so then they knew what it meant. This guy relied completely upon God. The rich man, he obviously relied upon himself, relied upon his riches. Lazarus trusted in God's word. Later on in this story, we read that the rich man paid no attention to the, the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. His brothers paid no attention to the law and the prophets. They didn't trust in God's word. 
Lazarus relied on the mercy of God. He relied on the mercy of God. And for us, it's relying upon the mercy of God as expressed through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. Lazarus lived for the next world. The rich man lived for this world. Hey, you can live for this world, but it ain't going to last that long. Why, eternity is a long, 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 long. I could do that forever time, right? Rich man relied on himself. He didn't think he needed God. You know, self-reliant people will go will be in hell. They'll be self-reliant people in hell. Someone said the national anthem of hell is, I did it my way. <laughs> this is a fact. If you think you can just do life without God, you can get to do eternity without God. C.S. Lewis says, the damned are, in one sense, successful rebels to the very end. The doors of hell are locked on the inside. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom they demanded in this life. And so they are self-enslaved. He also said, all that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there would be no hell. Why are people eternity, eternally separated from God? Because they didn't want God. They didn't have time for God. They didn't need God. So God ultimately says, fine. You don't get me. The rich man relied on his righteousness. He thought he was good enough to get into heaven. Interesting, even though the poor man is outside his door begging and he ignores that guy. He thinks he's pretty good. I, I, yesterday reminded me the weather of a day I was down at, um, at a prison talking to a bunch of prisoners. And it was fascinating to me because everyone obviously shouldn't have been in there, of course. And, but they all said somebody else was worse than they were. They all thought they were pretty good. You know, good people will be in hell. In my life, I've asked hundreds of people this question. If you died today, are you sure you'd go to heaven? I've had hundreds of people tell me, I hope so. I've asked them, what are you basing that on? And I've had so many people say, well, I'm a pretty good person. And I will say, are you good enough? They don't like that question. Well, I think so. I keep the Ten Commandments. Okay, name them. Are you good enough? Well, what is good enough? Perfection. God is absolutely perfect, morally perfect, 100% righteous, totally holy, absolutely, completely, and separate from sin. And so will heaven be, which will make it so awesome. No one's going to rob you in heaven. No one's going to scam you. No one's going to lie about you or hate you. or cheat. It, It's perfect. But none of us deserve to get in. There was only one perfect person on this planet. His name is Jesus. And he loved us enough to become one of us so that he could die in our place, experience our hell for us, our separation from God for us, so that we could get the gift of eternal life through him. The rich man, I think, was relying on his religion because the whole context of this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees who were the most religious of the Jews. They, they added rules to the Old Testament as if we need more in the Old Testament. Yeah, you talk to people and a lot of people say, well, I'm a, I'm a religious person. I go to church. Religious people will be in hell. Religion is you trying to reach up and impress God a little bit. Christianity is God reaching down to you through his son, Jesus Christ, and you accepting the gift. 
Listen to me very carefully. I'm going to say this twice. Listen very carefully. We are not saved by what we have done, but rather by what we do with what Jesus did. We are not saved by what we have done, but rather what we do with what Jesus did. We're not saved by what we've done. All we've done is pile up a whole record of sin. We're saved by what Jesus did. What Jesus did was die for our sins. Die in our place. What we do is believe it. Receive it. Repent of our sin. And trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Commit our lives to it. This verse has been gnawing at me lately. I want you to listen to it very carefully. Listen to this verse. Matthew 7, 13. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. The only way to heaven is absolute dependency. Fully surrendered faith in Jesus Christ. Would you look at me for a second? This is bothering me. I read a quote by Pastor Charles Spurgeon, and he said he, he hoped that half of his congregation was truly saved. Look at me. I don't want you thinking that just because you said some magic words one day or just because something happened, you got baptized when you were 12, but then just kind of do life your way. God's in a little box. You get him out now and then on Sundays, but not if the weather's nice. Or when times are hard, I want you to be sure that you're relying completely on the Jesus Christ as your Savior. And your life is living that out every day. There's a third reality lesson that we're taught through this story. Death is certain. Earthly decisions determine eternal destinies. And number three, eternal realities create passionate evangelists. Eternal realities create passionate evangelists. Hit me as I read this story last week that this guy was an unlikely evangelist. Listen to what he says in verse 27. Then he said, I beg you, I pray you, Therefore, Father Abraham, Father, send him, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. This guy all of a sudden got concerned about his family. He goes on and it says, Abraham said, hey, they have Moses and the prophets. That's the, what they called the Old Testament. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, no, Father Abraham. If one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. I, I, I've talked to a lot of people, and I've heard, I'm hearing this more and more. Well, if there really is a God, why doesn't he just show up? Why doesn't he just write something in the sky? Then I would believe. Well, the problem isn't that God's hiding from us. God has revealed himself to us over and over and over again. The problem is we don't want to see it. These rich man's brothers had, and he, the rich man himself, they had the Old Testament. They had all the predictions of the Messiah. But they didn't listen. And they won't listen if somebody came back from the dead. 
You know what's ironic? There's another man named Lazarus in the Bible. Do you realize that? John chapter 11. And he is a guy Jesus rose from the dead. You don't want to know what else is interesting? Jesus rose from the dead. There is a guy that rose from the dead. You don't need signs and wonders. You need simple faith. Well, let's look at this unlikely evangelist. Four characteristics. One, the rich man became concerned about his family. Now, let me ask you a question. How concerned are you about your family, their eternal destiny? Are they all saved? Are you sure? I'm not just hoping that something back when they were six, but I mean, are they really saved? Are you concerned about your family? This guy was. Second, this guy became a prayer warrior. I pray you, I beg you. He's beseeching heaven on behalf of his loved ones. Are you praying for the salvation of your family members? Are you crying out to God for their souls? Number three, the rich man wanted to do all he could to be sure they received a witness. Last week, we talked about giving a witness. Uh, one of my friends, Terry, that was saved last week, he said, um, oh, I didn't. It's on my phone. This is what he said. He said, I got a testimony, and I want to share it. He said, as of today, I have a testimony, and I want to share it. This guy wanted his family to get a witness. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever told your family about Jesus Christ? Have you ever told them what God's done for you? Have they ever heard it out of your mouth? This guy in hell wanted somebody to tell his family and warn them. I had a lady come up to me. I was preaching on evangelism in a previous church, and she said to me, she said, would you pray, Pastor Dave, that God would send a Christian to my office to tell these people about Jesus? I said, absolutely not. She said, well, that doesn't make sense. You just talked about the importance of telling people about Jesus. I said, absolutely, but I'm not going to ask God to send a Christian to your office to tell them about Jesus. He's already sent you. You know what I realized a while back? If I want God to, to send people to my family members, I need to be talking to other people's family members. Fourth, this guy was persistent in his effort. Abraham says, They're not, they didn't believe the Bible. They're not going to believe somebody. And the guy says, no, 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 please, just send somebody. If somebody rose from the dead and talked to him, they would. he's persistent. Look, Sometimes we quit too soon, and sometimes we quit too quickly. I'm not talking about beating somebody up with the Bible, but I'm talking about not giving up. I'm talking about hanging in there. I'm talking about being consistent. I'm talking about continuing to share. Look at me. This guy in hell is an evangelist. He wants to be an evangelist. But you know what? It was too late. It's too late. People die every day. People die every second. Death is a certainty. There's a lesson we need to learn from this guy today. I think it's this. Don't be too late. You know, he was too late to save his family. I read this quote this week, and it's been bugging me. Pastor Charles Spurgeon said, If sinners be damned, let them 
at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. You know, there, there's coming a day it's going to be too late. Either you'll be gone or they'll be gone. It's coming a day it's going to be too late. And there's coming a day it's going to be too late for you. You see, this guy was not only too late for his family, he was too late for himself. He thought he had plenty of time. Whole life ahead of him. You know, I did, a, I did a funeral for a young man several months ago, 25 years old. One for a man is 40 years old. One for a child. Some of you have this in your mind. Well, yeah, when, you know, I'm going to do my thing and then... It might not happen. Real quickly, the wise evangelist, these four things. One, be concerned. What, what do you and I need to do? We need to be concerned about people. Number two, we need to pray for people. Number three, we need to witness and warn people. We need to tell them. We need to warn them. Number four, we need to persist in telling people. Persist in praying for people. I want to finish with... Last week we talked about God stories. I want to share a God story from one of my good friends. His name is Steve. He grew up in Southern California. This is his story. He said, despite a supposed salvation experience during VBS at the age of eight, I basically lived for myself up until my high school years, seeking validation and significance through athletics and academics. He said, but everything changed in an instant on June 18, 1979. It became a defining moment for me. I graduated in June and was traveling with a buddy down to Los Angeles to catch a Dodgers game when my vehicle was struck by a drunk driver in a head-on collision. The next thing I know, I was being awakened by medics. I kept hearing them say into the radio, DOA. DOA. What's DOA, I asked? Dead on arrival. Everyone involved was killed except me. I walked away with a few cuts and bruises and two broken teeth. But my friend died in that accident. He not planned on dying that day, but he did. And he wasn't ready. And neither was I. For Steve, it was a wake-up call. He tells about two months later, he's at this Christian college in Virginia, and he was in my dorm. He said, I'd never been around Christian young men before. He said he, he was going to a great church, and he was in a little Christianity 101 Bible study I led. And he writes, through all these things, the Lord graciously opened my eyes to Christ's beauty and my sinfulness. One night that fall, his working in my heart was so strong, I felt compelled to get alone with God. I drove up to the mountains and found a clearing. There, looking up the night sky with tears streaming down my face, the Father showed me my pride and ungratefulness and the sufficiency of Christ, sacrifice, paying for my sin. Repentance from sin and faith in God filled my heart, and I believe to this day I was genuinely converted that night. By the grace of God. Steve's a pastor now. And he tries to be an evangelist. 
What's the application? I don't know about you, but I am more convinced and committed than ever that I need to be fully available to God to make a difference in the lives of people, especially family members. What's our application? If you're not 100% certain, if your life doesn't show that you've been born again, You need, to be, you need to get certain you're saved today. Stupidest thing you can do is walk out of this building with any doubt. Because you don't know you're going to get another time. Can we bow our heads?